kind of focusing in on um, coordination compounds. So remember that a coordination compound really, you know, can kind of be thought of as like an ionic compound. Uh, there's sort of a, a cation, a positive guy. There's really an anion, a negative guy. And much like a ionic compound, when we kind of put a coordination compound together, you know, the goal is sort of to end up with no overall charge. And that's why a, a coordination compound contains basically two things. It contains that complex ion, which as we talked about and saw last time, uh, can be either a positive ion or it can be a negative ion. So your actual complex ion can be either one. And that also means that in order to balance out the charge on your complex ion, your counter ion can either be positive or negative as well. So you can have, again, either a positive or negative counter ion or a positive or negative uh, complex ion. We do sort of follow very similar sort of the rules like ionic compounds where always the positive guy comes first, followed by the negative guy and both sort of the, uh, the naming and the formula when you put them together. Uh, a lot of times when we're dealing with coordination compounds, uh, the actual complex ions, a lot of times are put in brackets. So that usually will indicate, um, you know, that that's sort of the complex ion part of it. A lot of times the uh, sort of counter ion will be on the outside. And again, sort of the position, just looking at the formula as to where that complex ion is in the formula, if it comes first, then obviously it's positive. And if it comes second, it's negative. There's some rules that we follow when we name coordination compounds or just complex ions in general. Um, we basically will name the ligands in alphabetical order. So some of those ligands, as we saw last time as well, have some different types of names depending on sort of what they are. Like for example, oxalate is oxalato, uh, carbonate is carbonato, uh, water is aqua or aqua. So some of these uh, sort of ligands will have some different names that you again do need to be familiar with. Um, what is a ligand? As we also talked about last time, a ligand is a Lewis base, uh, which means it has the ability basically to donate a pair of electrons. So things that are really good sort of Lewis bases as we've talked about before are things that have sort of, I don't wanna say extra electrons, but maybe gained electrons. So things like Cl minus, um, also things that are polar and have non-bonding electrons uh, around it, like water is a very good one. Uh, NH3, which is a polar molecule, has got the non-bonding electrons of the nitrogen. So those things make really good ligands. And the idea there is really our complex ion has a positively charged metal in the center, positively charged metal, usually maybe larger positively charged metal. That means it's sort of electron deficient. So it sort of acts, if you want to think about it in sort of the Lewis acid base genre, it would be acting as your Lewis acid, your kind of metal that's in the middle. We also talked about sort of coordination number as well. Remember that it is based on the type of ligand that attaches there. There are certain ligands that are monodentate, which attaches in one place per molecule, which kind of gives you a one coordination number per molecule. There's some that are bidentate like oxalate and like that ethyl endyl diamine, that EN one that we saw. Those are bidentate, which means for every one molecule, you get basically two binding points, if you will, to the metal. Uh, which means basically you get two for the coordination number for every molecule. And there's some that could go even higher than that. We saw EDTA that could go like six sort of spots where on one EDTA molecule, it could bind in six different locations. Um, and again, obviously that would give it a coordination number of six per one of those EDTA molecules. So um, that's important to remember when we think about sort of coordination number. When we go about naming these guys, as we talked about, um, again, um, we want to name the ligands. If it has sort of a special name, obviously you want to use that special name. We also use prefixes to indicate how many of the ligands are attached. Um, remember as well, the kind of weird thing that if the actual ligand itself has a prefix in it, then we don't use things like di, tri, or tetra. We go to like bis, tris, and tetricus as sort of the prefixes that we use. Uh, for like uh, two, three, and four. Um, in terms of the complex ion part of the name, the metal always comes at the end and we always use a Roman numeral. So we talked a little bit about this last time. Uh, you know, even things where we typically in sort of normal nomenclature uh, does do not use like a Roman numeral, things like silver or things like zinc. Uh, we typically do use them in 
this type of nomenclature. Um, and even I think I mentioned it last time, it is possible to end up with a sort of metal that is neutral in that sense. And you can put a zero in there as well. That's also uh, commonly done sometimes in this type of uh, naming. So uh, prefixes, I'm um, sorry, uh, ligands, alphabetical order, the metal in the complex ions always comes at the end of the metal part of the name or the complex ion part of the name. So not necessarily the end of the entire name, uh, but at the end of the complex ion part of the name. And also the metal depends on whether or not your complex ion is positive or negative. So if your complex ion is a positive ion, then we use just a regular old name we're probably used to off the periodic table, you know, like iron. Uh, if it is a negative complex ion, we don't use sort of the regular name, if you will. We use the names that end in eight, kind of like the uh, root of those names or historical parts of those names. So again, something like iron would be called ferrate. And we also, again, use the Roman numerals with that as well. The complex ion, I'm sorry, the counter ion for the most part, uh, pretty much gets named just like it is, uh, no matter how many there are, if there are more than one of them. For example, if you just have, uh, you know, three sodiums, you just call it sodium. If you have like two nitrates as your counter ion, you would just call it nitrate. So for the most part, those uh, sort of counter ions get named, you know, just like normal. Any questions on any of that there that we talked about last time, I think. All right, so I think we left off here. Uh, so why don't you take a couple minutes here and we're looking for the proper names for each of these guys. So see what you come up with. Let's take a look here and see. So remember, we kind of want to maybe identify a couple of things up front to help us uh, get to the proper name. First off, we do see the brackets kind of here. So that indicates that this should be our complex ion. We also see it comes first in the formula, which means it's got to be positive. This guy here would be our counter ion, which obviously needs to be negative in this case. So starting with our complex ion part of the name here, uh, we got five of the ammonia and prefix for five is penta. Ammonia again is not called ammonia, it is called amine. And we do have a chlorine here. And remember uh, chlorine, fluorine, bromine, they become like chloral, floral, um, bromole type of names. So we have a chloral. And what is the oxidation number here of our cobalt? So again, we wanna kind of go through and sort of figure out what that is. And if we look at NA3, it is zero because it is no charge obviously associated with it. Uh, the chlorine here is really chloride, which is minus one. Our counter ion on the outside also gonna be minus one, but there's two of them, which gives us a minus two. So that's really a minus three overall, which means in this case, our cobalt is going to be plus three in this particular case. Because our complex ion is positive here, we're gonna go with the regular name of that, which then would be obviously cobalt three. Remember the Roman numeral for the charge. That's pretty much everything we need. We need to put it in alphabetical order, regardless of prefix. So A would actually go before C here, ignoring the prefix on that name. And that would get us pentamine, chloral, cobalt three, and now we're down to our counter ion in terms of the name. And again, as I talked about before, very similar to you know what we do when a traditional ionic compound, you know, something like this would be called calcium chloride, even though there's two of them. And we follow the same sort of rule here. So this would just be chloride again, no prefix or anything weird like that. So you just kind of sort of name the counter ion. Any questions on that name there? Okay. So uh, rolling into our second one here, uh, we got sort of an opposite setup here. So we see uh, potassium first here, which is going to be our counter ion. And again, because it comes first, it's going to be positive. We know this is most likely obviously our complex ion. 
as it contains kind of like the transition metal as well. So that's a good way to, you know, kind of figure that out. And that would be negative in this case. So looking at our complex ion part first, we want to sort of figure out what is the oxidation state on the iron. Potassium is plus one, and there's three of them, which gives us a plus three for the potassium. This is cyanide, and you know, it has to go individual here for the carbon and nitrogen. You hopefully know that Cn is Cn minus one, and that minus one charge takes into account the oxidation numbers for each of these, so no need to go individual sort of approach here. Uh, that gives us a minus six overall because there's six of them. That would also lay up a plus three there on our iron. Any questions on that? Okay, so uh, the other important thing is obviously, as we just mentioned, this is a negative complex ion, which means instead of iron three, this will now become ferrate three. Again, kind of that older school way of naming because our complex ion is negative. And uh, hexa is the prefix for six and cyanide is cyano. And then we just kind of want to put it together here. So because our counter ion is positive, we're going to start with that. Again, kind of the same idea as what we talked about there today. We had K2O, this is just called potassium oxide. So even though there's two of them here, same idea here, even though there's three, this would be potassium. Again, uh, ligand first. Hexa, just write in the right scribble there. Hexa cyano ferrate and Roman numeral three. Any questions on either of those names? And again, just to remind you, what you're talking about in terms of the metal coming at the end of the complex ion name. So again, here. This is the metal at the end of really the complex ion part of the name, not necessarily the end of the actual name. And here, this is really the complex ion part of the name, again, metal coming at the end. So that's again, what we're talking about there. Any questions on any of that? All right, so just to finish up here, uh, in terms of this naming aspect of it, let's do a couple of formulas here. So write the correct formulas for each of these coordination compounds. Uh, triamine bromyl platinum two chloride and potassium hexafluorocobaltate three. Just really kind of break it apart into really all the individual parts and then just sort of put it back together. We can get a couple of pieces of information here uh, from the actual name. We see here that this is platinum two and it comes before this name. So that implies that obviously this part here is our complex ion part. And we also know it's positive again because it comes before our counter ion over here. So uh, going through the name here, we have triamine, tri is three, amine is NH3. So basically we got uh, three of those guys. That takes care of that part. We have bromol with no prefix, which would imply one. So we got a BR basically. And we have a platinum two, which is obviously a platinum uh, with a positive two charge. So that really is our complex ion part. So we really can just throw them in there actually and just put them together. Now, the important part though, is to sort of remember, you know, sort of the charges on all these guys and what's going on. So if we think about it again, BR really is BR minus, this has no charge. So really what we're looking at here is a minus one and a plus two, which means technically speaking, this complex ion right here has a plus one charge. That's important because when we look at chloride, which is minus one, we know that really to balance it out, we just need one of those guys. Again, that gives us a minus one from the chloride, a plus one for the overall complex ion, and that gives us a zero for our coordinated compound there. Question on that. 
And looking at the last one here, again, following sort of the same approach, we actually see cobalt take three at the end of the entire name, which means this is obviously our complex ion part. It's obviously negative because it comes at the end. This guy is our counter ion, which is positive. And by the way, we also know this guy is negative because that looks like old school type name happening there. So starting with our counter ion, that is K plus, right? We have hexafluoral. Hexa is six, floral is F. So we basically have six of these guys. Cobaltate is cobalt with a plus three charge, which is what the Roman numeral means. So putting together first our uh, complex ion, COF6, if you want, you can parentheses it. You don't necessarily have to in this particular case. But again, we want to kind of figure out what is the uh, sort of overall charge that's happening here. Well, each of these Fs are really F minus. That means that's a minus six. And from our cobalt, it's a plus three, which means when we add that together, that basically means that this complex ion actually has a minus three charge. That's important because in this case, we don't need just one of these guys. We will need three total of those guys to balance out the charge. Three potassiums at plus one each gives us a plus three, balances out the minus three charge there of our complex ion. Any questions on that? Any questions on naming these guys, uh, writing the formulas? So obviously uh, you do need to be able to do both of those things, name and write the formulas. And as was I think asked last time, uh, they will not be provided for you, those sort of ligand names. So you are kind of responsible for those names uh, so that you know how to obviously do it correctly. Any questions on any of that? Also a reminder that if you just have really the ion by itself, you know, for example, if we just had, you know, CO, whoops, CO F6 uh, minus three complex ion, the name of that would be just get rid of the con the counter ion and it would be you know hexafluorocobaltate 3 ion would be the name of that guy so again um if you need to name just the complex ion by itself you pretty much just do the normal naming like you did here and just leave off obviously the counter ion part of the name all right so that is uh, coordination compounds and uh how to name them um how to write the formulas we're now going to talk about uh, some things that occur with these type of compounds. And these are what are sometimes referred to as sort of isomers or different types of isomers. Isomers in general uh, basically means that you have the same molecular formula, but some type of different sort of connectivity, if you will, in a lot of cases. And what that means is you can have like, uh, again, two things that, you know, have the exact same formula. Isomers come about a lot in organic chemistry. So for example, if you just had like, say, you know, something like this. Just to illustrate an isomer type situation. This guy here is basically five carbons in a row. This is what is known as pentane. If I could write that right, spell that again, pentane, there we go. Now, if we didn't have say five carbons in a row, but maybe we only did four carbons in a row and put the fifth one up on top. This would actually be an isomer um, this is one, two, three, four carbons in a row. Uh, four carbons in a row is actually what is known as butane. And this would be two methyl butane. And again, they have different names. They also will have different sort of properties as well. But if you count up everything that's there, they both have, put the right amount of carbons there, they both have uh, five carbons and 12 hydrogens. So these are basically what are referred to as um, 
these are really what are referred to as um, isomers of each other. Uh, they contain the exact same numbers and stuff, but uh, they uh, then have obviously different connectivity and different um, sort of naming. Okay, um, so when we talk about isomers, uh, isomers are really the um, <clears throat> the same molecular formula, but again, because of this different connectivity, they do have different properties and, and they have different sort of, um, um, sort of properties that they exhibit because of they're technically kind of different molecules, even though they're really made up of the same core elements and stuff like that. So here in isomers, there's a couple different types we're gonna see here. Some are referred to as structural isomers and structural isomers have basically different bonds. And there's a couple of different types we're gonna talk about, uh, coordination isomers and linkage isomers. And we'll talk about sort of what the difference is between both of those in just a second. There's also stereoisomers, which kind of have the same actual uh, bonds, but the difference is sort of the orientation in three-dimensional space is a little bit different in terms of how they are put together. And those are sometimes referred to as geometric uh, isomers, which can be cis or trans. So we'll talk about what that means in a second. And also some optical isomers as well. So let's talk a little bit about these guys. Let's first talk about uh, coordination isomers. And coordination isomers are again, guys that uh, pretty much have some different bonds and you may look at both of these. And again, uh, you can see, you know, really if you just kind of count off everything, there's one chromium, one chromium, uh, one ammonia, one ammonia, and uh, I'm sorry, five ammonia is a five, one sulfate, one sulfate, uh, one bromine and one bromine. You may say to yourself, like kind of looks like the same thing, but there is a slight difference as to what's happening in this particular case. Here in the uh, bracket part, this would be our complex ion. This would be our counter ion here. And what we see is in this arrangement, in my really badly drawn situation here, we have chromium that basically has five NH3s attached to it. and attached to it as well would actually be the sulfate. And sort of on the outside here, this overall thing would have like a plus one charge. On the outside as sort of the counter ion would be our bromine. Now the difference is when we look at this complex ion, although it still has that chromium in the center, it still has the five NH3s attached. Instead of the sulfate being attached, here the bromine's actually attached as part of the complex ion. So the difference here is, and obviously the sulfate, which is minus two, would balance out the plus two that's happening here. The difference here is in the first case, the bromine is really not part of the complex ion. It's not attached to the complex ion. In the second case, the bromine is attached and the sulfate is not. So these are coordination isomers. Again, identical sort of uh, guys that are present, but different arrangement that's happening, different connections, and obviously would have some difference in terms of its properties. Any questions on that? Now, another type of isomer like that is a linkage isomer. And here we basically got the same complex ion that's happening. And we even have the same ligand that we're talking about in each of these cases. The difference though is in actually where the linkage is happening to the complex or the uh, metal there, the cobalt. In the first case, it's actually linking through the nitrogen to the cobalt. So even though it's on that NO2, it's going to link through those kind of non-bonding electrons on the nitrogen and bond in there. But because we got some oxygens involved that also got some of those non-bonding electron pairs, in the second one, we're using the same ligand, but it's going to link in to our cobalt in the middle through the oxygen part, which is what we see here. So again, if we were to count up everything going on here, 
uh, we would have the same sort of uh, elements and everything present. But the difference here is actually within the actual ligand where it is linking or how it is sort of bonding to the metal that's in the middle. Any questions on that one there? So uh, then let's talk a little bit about stereoisomers. So stereoisomers uh, give rise to what are known as cis and trans isomers. Uh, they basically have sort of the same bonds, but different arrangement in three-dimensional space. So again, sort of relating, just to give you more of an organic chemistry sort of example of this that maybe will help you visualize what we're talking about. A lot of times in organic chemistry, when we talk about cis and trans, you know, it involves a double bond and it involves a double bond in terms of where groups are located in relationship to that double bond. So for example, if we had something like this, this is what would be known as the cis isomer. And basically cis means same side. It's a good way to remember that. And what we're talking about in sort of this application is the same side of the double bond is where that would be, could be on the top, they both could be on the bottom and that was both would be cis. Now, if we took that same sort of CH3 group and drew it just like this, one CH3 groups up on top, one's on the bottom. These are what are referred to as trans isomers, which means opposite side of the double bond here. And uh, that's basically what trans means. Again, if we kind of count up everything in both of these, we're identical in terms of, you know, what elements and stuff we got going on. But the difference is in organic chemistry here, for example, these double bonds pretty much lock those two carbons into place that they can't rotate or anything. So they're sort of locked, which locks those groups sort of in either the same side of the double bond or opposite sides of the double bond. Same thing sort of happens here with uh, sort of coordination compounds. We get some cis or trans isomers and they have the same atoms and the same bonds, but basically some different bond angles depending on sort of where they are uh, in three dimensional sort of space. They're common in square planar complexes. So if you remember square planar, you know, from uh, sort of geometry, that's kind of like your six electron pairs maybe only four bonds, you know, square planar as the name implies and not drawn very great here. It makes a square within the same plane. And you kind of have those like non-bonding electrons kind of coming up and up and out. And it makes this sort of geometric sort of geometry here uh, where basically everything here is within the same sort of plane. Here's a much better, maybe three-dimensional drawing of it. But uh, up on top, we have the cis isomer of this PTNH32Cl. And again, if you just take, uh, for example, your NH3s, they're on kind of the same side here of this sort of plane. And if you take the CLs as well, you see they are also on the same side. Uh, basically of this sort of square plane. The trans isomer, which is down here, we have basically kind of opposite sides, if you will, for an NH3 in terms of the plane of the molecule. Same thing here with the CLs also, you can look at those and they would be on opposite sides. Again, giving us that trans isomer. Again, if you count up everything that's going on here, we got exactly the same numbers of every element that's present. Again, just that location because they're kind of locked into place here in terms of this sort of square, if you will. Um, you know, these guys end up sort of be on the same side of the plane and these guys ended up being on opposite sides of the plane, sort of where the ligands are located uh, in relationship to each other. Here's an example of more of an octahedral type of complex here. Um, and again, we see an A trans and we see in uh, B here, the cis. So what makes sort of A trans versus sort of the B guy uh, cis, if we just kind of think about sort of this square here, if you will, being sort of the plane. We have kind of with our chlorines, if we look at it, one that's sitting kind of above the plane and one just kind of sitting below the plane. Again, 
opposite sides basically giving us that trans sort of situation here and again if we sort of look at the second guy here in the same sort of fashion you know you could kind of see that the chlorines are one sitting up on top and one also kind of sitting on the top of the plane as well. So sort of the same side here, giving it that cis uh, denotion here. Again, exact same complex ion in both cases. In both cases here, right, we would, um, by the way, call this, uh, this is, um, tetraamine dichloral and that is cobalt and that should be roman numeral three ion right if we were to name this guy and again trans opposite cis um, kind of the same side sometimes you know it's a little bit easier to visualize sometimes it's kind of hard to visualize uh you know same side opposite size uh, but that's sort of what we're looking at in this particular case. Now, optical isomers, uh, they have an opposite effect on what's referred to as plain polarized light. Um, there's something referred to when we talk about isomers a lot, um, uh, what is referred to as being chiral. And chiral means basically that it has a non-superimposable mirror image. That's basically what chiral means. What does that mean? I think we'll see a picture of it here in just a second, but it's like if you put your hand up to a mirror, you get your other hand basically facing back to you. And what that means is if you pull out the image from the mirror, so the reflection of your hand from the mirror, you could do whatever you like to that image. You could rotate it, you know, flip it, whatever it may be. You'll never get your original hand and your mirror image of your hand to match up perfectly. They're non-superimposable. You may think, well, if I just kind of rotate my hand this way, they match up, right? They do match up, but the thumbs are on the wrong side, right? So you could play with your hands if you like, don't break your hands or anything like that. But, uh, you know, you could rotate, you know, again, that mirror image, you'll either end up with thumbs on the wrong side, palm up, palm down. You won't have really the right orientation. And those are what are referred to as being sort of what chiral molecules means. It means if you kind of push up a molecule to a mirror and you take that mirror image out of the mirror, you could do as much rotation or movement of it. There's always going to be something that will not sort of line up, if you will, kind of like your thumbs. It won't really line up when you take it out and stuff like that. And that's different than, we don't get too much in it here, what is referred to as achiral. An achiral molecule is the opposite of that. An achiral molecule is one where if you take the mirror image out, um, it will match up perfectly with the original sort of image. They'll, they'll come on to each other as well. So uh, these isomers are sometimes referred to as enantiomers because of that. This is sort of the example of uh, plain polarized light. Um, Again, uh, we shoot it unpolarized through a sort of a filter. We get them all kind of going in a same direction. You could also measure sort of the rotation of that light, giving you sort of this angle of rotation. Also how we get things like D and L isomers and stuff like that. Here's maybe a better picture of the uh, hand example there. Again, if you pull that image of your hand out of the mirror, with much rotation as you want, you'll never get it to perfectly sit right on top of the other one, and it really will not be superimposable. So when we look at some uh, isomers here, for example, uh, isomer one and isomer two are mirror images. <clears throat> the mirror image of one is identical to two, um, and it cannot be superimposed. So there's no way that you can uh, take number one and turn it in space to get it to be the same as number two. And you may be saying to yourself, they kind of look the same. What is really sort of the difference here, right? So when we sort of put this guy up to the mirror, right, things start to you know reflect, if you will. And when things reflect, what ends up happening though is it's a very subtle difference in terms of the bond. So I won't draw all these lines. I'll just highlight sort of where the difference is so we can kind of see it. Uh, I'll get rid of that real quick. 
So again, if you are sort of doing the mirror image, you just kind of want to reflect things back to where they're at. And what ends up happening when we look at sort of the mirror image versus the original guy, there is actually a difference in sort of connectivity. In the original image, you got this connectivity sort of happening between those two nitrogens. In the mirror image, what you can see is that nitrogen now gets connected really to the guy in the back. And that little difference there is what's going to cause when you take that second isomer out of the mirror and you start rotating it, you're always gonna kind of have a nitrogen in the wrong location because of that little difference in connectivity that occurs from the mirror image as it's projected into the mirror to how it's sort of connected in, I guess, real life and then before the, it kind of had his mirror image. Any questions on that? So that little difference in connectivity, kind of like your thumb, it just means it's sort of in the wrong spot, you know? And again, you could kind of rotate, rotate, but because there's that new kind of connection that's occurring, as it rotates, something is always going to be off as you move it around in sort of three-dimensional space. So those guys would be what are referred to as chiral sort of each other. They have non-superimposable mirror images. Now, if we look at the trans uh, isomer here <clears throat> of COENCL2+, and its mirror images, um, they are superimposable. The cis isomer and its mirror image are not superimposable and thus the pair of uh, our optical isomers. So when we look at our trans isomer here, again, when we look at sort of the, just the connections that are happening, we have these sort of nitrogens connected on the outside. Our original guy also has those connections. We have kind of the same connections happening here and here and here, which means when we pull these out, is going to be pretty much identical and will superimpose with no problem. Uh, so these are, you know, really what I refer to as being achiral in this sort of case. On our sort of uh, cis isomer over here, we have the same connectivity issue as we had with the other one. Although these two nitrogens reflect perfectly in the mirror, when we get the reflection of this, we get our nitrogen to nitrogen, which is up front here with each other. But that second nitrogen gets reflected to the back of the mirror, meaning that the connectivity that's going to occur goes to the back. So again, we get that difference in connectivity that happens here as we get that sort of reflection that's happening. Remember that when we put it up to a mirror, this guy is gonna reflect close. This guy is gonna basically reflect backwards. And again, that sort of how that different connectivity occurs. So again, sort of similar to what we were just talking about a second ago with our other um, cis isomer over there, our isomer, it does not, will not be superimposable because there will always be something that will be sort of off in that second case. Any questions on that? And really that's a result of, as you could kind of see, you know, you got kind of a, a little different group happening there. So as we sort of reflect, we get some of that different connectivity that occurs. So what are enantiomers? Enantiomers basically are two um, molecules that are mirror images of each other that are non-superimposable. So they're chiral. Uh, they're called again enantiomers. A lot of biomolecules are chiral. Uh, even some drugs um, you know, are chiral as well. Um, but only one of them are effective maybe in treating, again, because they're sort of isomers of each other and they have some different connectivity, that's gonna result in, again, some differences in terms of you know, some of the properties that these guys will basically have. Any questions on that there? Okay, uh, we're gonna do, I think, a stop because the next topic, we need a little bit more time than probably what we will have left. So I wanna run right into the exam and stuff like that.